A welcome everybody to this evening's lecture. Hallmark Veterinary Imaging is proud to present a webinar on neurology for images with a focus on inflammatory central nervous system disease. Thank you so much for logging in to the webinar this evening. My name's Philip from Vet Education, your host for this webinar. I'm going to hand the microphone duties over right now to Dr. Karen Johnson from Hallmark Veterinary Imaging, who's going to say a few words and ask you a few questions this evening. Thank you, Karen, uh, for joining us this evening for the webinar. Well, thank you, Philip and Charisma, for hosting it. We appreciate it. I know you guys are up very early there in um, Queensland, so thank you. Um, as Philip said, I just wanted to take a minute to do a little um, advertisement for Hallmark's Pet Vet Machine and then ask you a few questions and then we'll get started with the webinar. So thank you for indulging me on the next slide. So our R&D team um, is always looking for ways that we can solve problems for veterinarians and do things better in the realm of MRI imaging. So they've asked me to ask you some questions today and there's a few that are poll questions where you just sort of vote, and then a few that if you could type in um, the chat line um, there, we'll, we'll be able to pick those up later. So the first question is, and I move this fill up, okay. Do you currently use susceptibility weighted imaging? And it's simple as yes, no, or number three, don't have any idea what you're talking about, unfamiliar with it. So if you can just... Um, Vote. Okay, look, it looks like people know how to vote. We haven't actually taught you how to do that. Um, so do they need any, ins I don't think they need instruction. Everybody's doing it. We'll give you a few minutes. Just, um, I guess, type in the chat box if you don't know how to, um, to vote. Okay, we will leave it there. It looks like most people do use susceptibility weighted imaging. Okay, so the next question is, and this is where you'll need to type in the chat box, is what type of cases do you use it for or would you use it if you had it? So if you could just type in the chat box what you're using susceptibility weighted imaging for and if you don't have it, um, if you would get it, could you please um, let us know what sort of cases you would use it for? So that, so we'll just need people to do some typing and you can always, um, Okay, cool. I see some typing going on. Thank you so much for that. If you have any specific diseases you want to let us know about, um, that would be good too. Okay, and keep, keep your answers coming and then we'll just go to the third question while people think about that and throw some answers down. And the third question is, how frequently do you use or would you use susceptibility weighted imaging? So um, one time a month, four times a month, 12 times a month, or even more than 12 times a month. So is this something you're using quite regularly all the time or something that's only used occasionally? It's really the question. Once a month, four times a month, 12 times a month, or even more than that. Oh, looks like people really like it and use it. OK. OK, that's, pr let's see, what do you think? There's only a few people answered that. OK, polls closed, that's fine. OK, and then we have the same three questions about MR and geography. So the first question is, do you currently use MR and geography? There we go. So you can either say vote one for yes, two for no, and again, three, don't know about it, unfamiliar, don't know what you're talking about. OK, so it looks like this one's just the opposite. So many people are not using, getting more no's than yeses. Thank you for that. Okay, and then um, the second question is as before, what type of cases do you use or would you use it for if you had it? So the type of cases that you're using MR and geography for, um, if you don't have it, um, what would you use it for if you did? And if you could just put a few, um, a few ideas down in the chat box, that would be really helpful. Oh, good. A few people are typing. Thanks so much for doing that. It's really, it helps our R&D team to, um, yeah, to try to um, make products that um, better suit, serve our customers if we know what you're thinking and what you want. And, um, and likewise, if, if there's anything you would love to, um, to have from an imaging company, then you can just send us a random email too and we'll try to respond to that. 
Okay, um, and then do keep typing as you think of things, but let's get the final um, poll questions out of the way so we can get on to the lecture, and that is how frequently um, do you use or would you use MR and geography? So again, again, the answer is um, once a month, four times a month, 12 times a month, or even more than that. And again, it looks like this is um, pretty different to susceptibility-weighted imaging where not too many of you are using it, the ones that do, maybe about once a month. So anybody else have a, OK, the poll's closed. OK, thank you very much for doing that. That really helps, so I appreciate that. OK, now I think, um, Philip, you put in the slide about the pet vet. So this is just my, uh, I'm not ashamed um, to just give you one slide on advertising our pet vet 1.5 Tesla MRI, if you will indulge me, please. Um, there's a picture of it there on the right. And I just want to quickly tell you about it in case you don't know about it. Um, it's a machine made for dogs and cats, so it produces great images with our coils um, made for our patients. And you can see the V-shaped spine coil there in the picture. It has very little downtime. It's a very robust machine because we have um, sensors built into the machine. So there's about 25 set sensors. Every five minutes, we're getting about 110 different data points from each machine out there. They get sent into head office, and we're able to um, just basically measure the health of the machine. If anything goes wrong, we can usually routinely go in and fix it um, with that, and without you even knowing it. So it really creates um, a machine with very little downtime. So we're constantly assessing it and, and um, fixing things as needed. It has a zero boil-off cold head on it, so you won't need any routine helium refills. Um, the Faraday cage is sort of built around the machine. It has its own RF shielding, so you don't need to do anything special. You just put it into a normal room construction sort of um, place in your hospital. Super easy to use. We've designed it so anybody in the hospital can be trained to use it. You don't have to hire anybody special. It's a super easy machine. Um, and something that makes Hallmark very different is that we're vet only. So we're not um, worried about the human hospitals down the road. We're really just concerned about our, our profession and making sure the machines are running for veterinarians. You need about 10 cases a month for it to pay for itself. And we're very happy to talk about any sort of payment options, whether it's a cash sale or a monthly rental or some other um, way that we can come up with so that you can uh, pay for a high field machine. So if any of that is interesting to you, then please get in touch with us, pet vet at hallmark.net. Send me a note in the chat box or go to our website, and there's lots of phone numbers there. So thank you very much for allowing me to do that little advertisement. And with that, I will get on to introducing Dr. Maddie Essex so we can get on with the lecture. So after graduating in 1999, achieving her doctoral degree in peripheral nerve research and performing an internship at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital, LMU Munich, Dr. Maddie Eska underwent a neurology neurosurgery residency at the Animal Health Trust in Newmarket, UK. She qualified as an ECVN diplomat in 2007 and worked as Animal Health Trust senior neurologist neurosurgeon for three years. Moving back to Munich, she was employed as senior neurologist at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital from 2011 to 2014 and senior neurologist neurosurgeon at Tier Clinic Carr from 2014 to 2017. She served as an ECVN examination committee member and chair and currently works at the Anacura Klein Tier Clinic Babenhausen in Germany. And I know she gives a fantastic lecture, so we're looking forward to it, Laura, and I'll send, hand it over to you. Uh, good evening and hello everyone, or let's say good morning as well to some of you. I hope you can hear me well. And Karen, thank you very much for the nice introduction and the opportunity to talk about a neurologist's perspective on inflammatory CNS disease in dogs and cats tonight. If there are any questions for the audience in between, please feel free um, to type them in. I'll try to answer as good as I can. And please feel also free um, to let me know if I talk too quickly, because that tends to happen to me as I go through my talks. Um, all right, um, then we'll get started. The first slide, just really quickly, um, shows um, what my lecture um, is focused on and how it's structured. 
Um, I'll give a brief overview on inflammatory CNS disease in general. Then I want to show you how we clinicians systematically approach inflammatory brain disease in dogs and cats, highlighting the role of MRI in diagnosing and subsequently managing those diseases. And I do think there is a lot what we neurologists can learn from images and um, vice versa. In general, if we look at inflammation of the central nervous system, there are different structures that can be affected. It can be the meninges, um, so the layers around the brain, and the spinal cord. It can be the brain itself and the spinal cord itself or various um, combinations of those. We localize um, the problem via the neurological deficits and sometimes um, via local pain that might be present. However, talking about main symptoms of inflammation in general, we always would think pain is a main feature, right? But very often, inflammation of the central nervous system is not painful unless the meninges, and in particular the meninges of um, the spinal cord, are affected. Might be different if we have very chronic neuropar uh, neuroparenchymal lesions um, and we get a chronic uh, neuropathic pain set off. Typically, for CNS inflammatory disease, obviously, are multifocal neurologic deficits, as inflammatory disease like to sit in various locations. But there are certain diseases where animals might display just focal neurologic deficits. Very typical as well would be an acute onset of the disease with progressive cause. However, there are some diseases which might display a very chronic cause. For example, just think about the um, chronic CNS form of distemper. Generally, we distinguish quite simple between infectious and the non-infectious immune-mediated disease. Uh, where with the infectious disease, we got the classic group mentioned here. And on this slide, more in detail. I'm obviously not going to go through every single disease in detail. It would be too much. And you all have it in your notes as well. But if we think about viral disease in the dog, what pops to our mind is distemper. In certain areas, tick-borne encephalitis virus. But there are also some more rare viruses that might affect um, the brain. In the cat, obviously, the FIPs or the coronavirus. Um, but also other viruses that might affect it. Both species are affected or can be affected by rabies or very rarely pseudorabies um, uh, or West Nile, depending on the region. Bacterial infectious disease, per se, don't really play such a great role in small animals, but we do occasionally see them. For fungal disease, again, it depends on where you're located, right? Like in southern Europe or certain areas, of the states, they're very, very prevalent. Um, for example, in Germany, or those seven years that I've been working in the UK, I've not really seen any fungal CNS disease. What might occur occasionally are protozoal or rickettsial disease or verminous disease. And obviously, there's the group of miscellaneous disease then, which might be, for example, Portrotica or some prion, such as FSE. Not that I've ever seen one, but obviously, I have to list them here. Now, which routes can infections take to the CNS? They can um, approach the CNS via the bloodstream, or they can be extending from neighboring focuses. And I will show you some MRI pictures as we go on. Moreover, you might have perforating trauma. And there's some disease, for example, herpes virus, um, uh, that uh, chooses the nerve to travel into the CNS. or um, be hosted there. Oops, next slide. All right. Now, how about the non-infectious or immune-mediated disease? Obviously, we do call them idiopathic, because idiopathic, we always call everything that we don't actually have a clue about what's really going on. There might certainly be um, a degree of genetic predisposition. I'll come to that a bit more in detail later. And there might be some triggers, such as infections or um, environmental um, triggers that you could think about. 
a very nice overview about these non-infectious inflammatory disease is given by a review from Joan Coates and Nick Jeffrey, and they actually distinguish it into the big group of the MUOs, the meningeal encephalitis or meningeal encephalomyelitis of unknown origin, or you might put an A or E in the end if you want to talk about etiology. Uh, they contain the classic GME, the granulomatous meningeal encephalomyelitis, that was the first one that was known, and now more emergent, obviously, the necrotizing encephalitis, um, including the necrotizing meningeal encephalitis and the necrotizing gluc encephalitis. Moreover, they also add to these groups of non-infectious inflammatory CNS disease, the steroid responsive meningitis arteritis, the eosinophilic meningeal encephalitis, and the idiopathic tremor syndrome, which is also called idiopathic cerebellitis or um, little white dog, dog shaker syndrome, despite those dogs not always being white and not always being little. All right. Um, are there any questions so far, or are you happy to head on with the clinical approach? No, no questions so far, so um, we'll probably um, just continue then. So what is important for me uh, from the clinical approach is to start off with the signalment and the history of the animal. I'll come back to that in a bit more detail later. Then a general physical examination is really important when you assess for um, CNS inflammatory disease. Uh, because especially infectious disease might cause some systemic um, signs as well. Um, then obviously my general neurologic examination and the first question that I want to answer with that, is my patient neurological, yes or no? And if I'm convinced it's neurological, I obviously want to localize the problem. And I'm sure you're all looking forward to neurolocalization and I'll go through that with you um, briefly. We neurologists try to keep it fairly um, simple and distinguish whether the problem is in the central or peripheral nervous system. Once we're convinced it's centrally located, we want to distinguish do we have a brain or spinal cord problem. And if we think the problem is in the brain, like every textbook tells you, you distinguish between the forebrain, cerebellar, and brainstem localization. However, something that I like to do as well is I like to point out particular vestibular localization. Why that? If a client calls you in your practice or in your clinic and the dog or cat is not well, they're not going to call you and say, hey, can I see you? My dog has a forebrain or a brainstem problem. But they're going to call and say, my dog or cat is having a head tilt. It's having weird eye movements, meaning as tagmos, it's circling or falling, right? So I think it's quite nice to take that vestibular a bit out. And vestibular meaning the peripheral part can be affected, so the animal might have an inner ear disease, or the um, vestibular nerve itself might be affected, or central parts might be affected. And central parts of the vestibular system sit here in the brainstem nuclei, but also here in the vestibular cerebellum, which is one of the three parts of the cerebellum. OK. Now, finally, the first MR pictures. What you see here are T2-weighted MRI pictures through a dog's brain. And you're probably all familiar with um, the classic division into forebrain, cerebellum, your forebrain, cerebellum, and brainstem. Now, let's go a bit into forebrain um, localizations first. Uh, on this picture, on the left-hand side, you see um, a mid-sagittal T2-weighted image of a dog's brain with the respective transverse T2-weighted image on the right-hand side um, where the line here goes through. Why is that picture um, mid-sagittal, or we can also say midline sagittal? Does anybody have an idea? Anybody? wants to write something in the chatting box, I'll have a look. 
I can see some. Yes, exactly. Somebody said the right answer. It was Laura, uh, because we can see the interthalamic adhesion or the muscle intermedia, highlighted here by that little star. Another thing that I want to point out, if you talk about the forebrain, or also called um, telencephalon, right? It's not just the, um, uh, it's not just, sorry, or the prosencephalon. It's not just the cerebrum, the telencephalon, but it is also the diencephalon, containing structures um, such as here the thalamus and also hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and epithalamus. So you should be aware of that. If we talk about signs localized in the forebrain, it's not just cerebrum. It can also be a diencephalic um, lesion. Otherwise pointed out here uh, by those little arrows are the paired lateral ventricles in the forebrain. And then here, those two little dots, the ring-like third ventricle that runs around the interthalamic adhesion. All right, typical forebrain signs. I'm sure you've all thought about seizures. That's quite classic. The animals might display um, altermentation or um, behavioral disorder. They can be compulsive. They're restless. They might show head pressing. They might also show a pleurotonus. Can anybody define pleurotonus? Do you want to type in the chat box? Anybody an idea what pleurotonus is? Yes, Elizabeth Passmore just said it's a truncal turn. Exactly. I will show you a picture of a dog. He's not just looking around. He's having pleurotonus. And um, I always describe it as a sort of banana turn of the head and the body, right? So if you look at an animal from the front to distinguish a head or head and body turn from a head tilt, with a head tilt, which indicates a vestibular dysfunction, one ear will be lower than the other. Whereas with a pleurotonus and that turn, they will have this banana shape. All right? OK. Um, the pleurotonus, as well as the circling, they're going to display to the ipsilateral, so to the same side of the lesion. And I'll explain in a second why. Whereas Proprioceptive deficits and blindness or reduced facial sensation, that is going to be displayed to the contralateral side of the lesion. The same as the hemispatial neglect syndrome, also called inattention syndrome. And I explain in a second what that is. Um, why is all that contralateral? Let's say we have a lesion here in the right side um, of the forebrain. The left side of the body projects to the right side um, of the forebrain and vice versa, right? So if I have a lesion on the right side, the dog is going to have a bad or no perception on the left side of the body, revealing proprioceptive deficit, blindness, reduced facial sensation. For hemispatial neglect, I'll explain you something, or hemian attention syndrome. A typical example is you put a bowl of food on the floor for an animal with a right-sided forebrain lesion. What the animal is not going to be aware of is the left side of his world, right? So it's probably not going to eat the food in the left side of the bowl. I hope that sort of more or less makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's all contralateral. So why do animals no, now show this pleurotonus and circling? to the side of the lesion. So with the right side of the lesion, they will circle to the right and so show pleurotonus of the right, to the right. Reason is because they're not aware of the left side of the body. So what they actually do when they circle to the right and turn the body to the right, they think they're going straight. I hope that more or less makes a bit sense with those localizations. All right, I do want to show you the first full brain case and also my first multiple choice question. Um, on that little dog, it was a Yorkie, it was a little girl, she was um, four or five years old. The dog that I showed with the pleurotonus to the right before. And I hope the video is playing now. What you can see is there are proprioceptive deficits on the left hand side here in the front lens. Also, 
as you will see in a second here, no proprioception on the left hind leg. You can also appreciate that slight um, head body turn intermittently to the right, whereas proprioception on the right is fine in the front and the hind limb, as you just saw. And again here, oh sorry, video jumped back, I'll try to be quicker. And here again, the deficit. Okay. So, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. I like it. I'm happy if you like the video, Karen. <laughs> so my question to you is, where do you localize your problem? And that's going to be your first poll question. Is the problem in the left forebrain, the right forebrain, bilateral forebrain, or do you think the dog does not have a forebrain problem at all? Oh, everybody is so good. I think this is probably far too easy for you. Can I advance? Ah, oh, no, I can't. How can I? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, sorry, I was too quick. <laughs> Obviously, the dog had a localization in its right forebrain, and you were all right. So I had. I think we have to increase the level here a bit. All right. Next compartment is the cerebellum, or the so-called small brain. It lives here in the caudal fossa and is separated from the rostrocranial fossa here via the osseous and which you can't see here, the membranous tentorium cerebelli. And here we got the respective um, uh, transverse situated um, image. And highlighted here with those little arrows, we got the fourth ventricle that lives kind of under the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum is responsible for fine tuning. Important to know is that it does not initiate um, uh, motor activity. Now, if we have an animal uh, that displays cerebellar signs, we might have the classical trias of ataxia, hyper or dysmetria, and intention tremor. What does intention tremor mean? Actually, I told you that um, with cerebellar lesions, or I tell you now that the fine tuning does not work. So the animal, for example, is trying to reach its food with its head, but it's really, really having um, uh, problems and um, is really having problems uh, to to reach that and showing a horribly wobbliness with his head. However, we might also see menace deficits with cerebellar lesions. And why that? The animal have an absolutely normal vision. They can close their eye. They don't have a problem with the per people um, reflex. But we know that the menace response makes us so far not anatomically quite um, clarified um, loop via the cerebellum, right? Moreover, animals with cerebellar disease might display vestibular disturbances just because this caudal part of the cerebellum here is the vestibular cerebellum. However, they will always have a normal mentation as the ascending reticular formation here through the brainstem to the forebrain will be absolutely functioning and they're not going to have any proprioceptive placing deficit. OK, I just quickly want to share that gate with you of that Italian Spinoni that I saw when I was working back in the UK at the Animal Health Trust. Um, look at its gate. That dog does not any problem to initiate his movement, right? But he is absolutely dysmetric and hypermetric. This is a very, very classic cerebellar gait. Um, I'll just Stop the video now. That dog did not have um, an inflammatory disease. It actually had cerebellar aviotrophy. That is where they're born with a normal healthy cerebellum and um, during life they gradually lose function of certain neurons of the cerebellum. Okay, I hope everybody's still with me. We'll head on with neuroanatomy of the brain stem. The brain stem is divided in uh, three parts which here you can see the mesencephalon or midbrain, here with um, the arrow pointing out the mesencephalic aqueduct that is connecting here the ring-like third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. And then we got the ventral metencephalon or pons. I'm saying ventral because it's dorsal metencephalon of the cerebellum. And last but not least, we got the malencephalon or medulla oblongata um, back here. Now, animals with brainstem signs might display cranial nerve deficits, 
but not of the first and the second cranial nerve because they don't arise from or don't project to the brain stem. They're associated with the forebrain, namely being the olfactory and the optic nerves. And um, they're actually not even peripheral nerves like the others are. They're actually extensions of the brain. Moreover, animals with brain stem signs might display central um, vestibular um, problems and proprioceptive deficits, which in contrast to forebrain signs are ipsilateral, so on the same side of the lesions as the um, fibers haven't crossed yet. Uh, they might also display hemi or tetraparesis, elephantations, and in very severe cases, and especially in cases where um, the myelencephalon caudally is affected and respiratory and cardiovascular centers are involved also problems with um, breathing, breathing or um, cardiovascular issues. All right, um, any questions so far regarding neurolocalization? Um, no? Okay, so we'll head on with our differential diagnosis. Uh, we neurologists love our Demnit V or vitamin um, uh, D scheme and I guess you're all familiar with it. Um, very important for me is to look at the signalment, to uh, look how old is the animal, what breed do we, do we have. Sometimes we might even have a gender predisposition for certain disease. If I'm suspicious of inflammatory disease, obviously it's very important to ask, where does the animal live? Where does it come from? Does it have any travel history? Might I have to expect some infectious disease that, you know, might have brought home from a holiday? Is the animal vaccinated? What kind of food does it get? Next question that is important to answer looking at the differential is the start and um, progression uh, of the signs. Typically, uh, inflammatory disease are described as fairly acute in onset and having a progressive course. However, a chronic cause, and again, think about the chronic CNS distemper, there are other, some other diseases as well, which I'll mention later on, um, might cause uh, rather chronic causes. Last but not least, the localization or lateralization of, um, of signs, um, where the typical thing for inflammatory disease is that they like to be multifocal, um, but also focal signs are possible and certain inflammatory disease, and I'll show in a bit, even have certain predilection sites um, in the central nervous system. Okay, now we have our differential diagnosis. As next thing, we need a um, diagnostic plan. But before I come to the diagnostic plan, I would like to test you again on your skills in neurolocalization. What would you think? Which neurolocalization is associated with the below shown picture? We have this food bowl that is empty on the left side, but we still got food on the right side. What do you think? This is associated with a lesion in the right brain stem, in the right forebrain, in the left forebrain, or the left cerebellum. Well, some people still changing their mind. <laughs> okay. All right. And the correct answer is the lesion is in the left forebrain. Why? If there's a lesion in the left forebrain, the animal is not going to be aware of the right side of his body and it's not going to finish the food on the right side of the bowl. I hope that makes sense. Okay, let's get back to our diagnostic plan. We're not at MRI yet. We want to do some blood examination first, just some CBC, serum, serum biochemistry, uh, serum antibody titers and PCR for infectious disease, but be careful, this is not necessarily uh, associated with an active 
CNS inflammation or infection, then some ancillary tests that I'm going to mention later. If indicated, some urine examination, but for sure we want to do an ophthalmologic examination. One reason for that is the eye is the window to the brain for us neurologists. The other reason is some disease might also manifest in the eye, for example, a cat with a CNS FIP might as well have an uveitis. All right, and now we finally come to magnetic resonance imaging, which usually always goes along with um, a CSF tab. And in some cases, we might even have to take a biopsy to achieve a definite diagnosis. As I just said before, MRI and CSF always go together, just like Bonnie and Clyde. And before I go into MRI, just a few words about the CSF tab, which is usually done after um, the um, MRI, and I'll mention later, I'll show you pictures um, why. Obviously, um, if we're suspicious of brain disease, we will do the CSF tab um, at the cisterna magna, or so-called Atlanta occipital puncture. Um, if you do a CSF tab, you should make sure you do it on a regular basis and a routine, because obviously we do want to avoid any kind of iatrogenic brainstem. Um, trauma. Once we have collected the CSF, we will look at the protein content via the PANDI test or can assess it quantitatively and we'll do a cell count and look at the cytology. We might want to, um, well, we definitely want to check for um, special um, uh, agents via PCR or antibodies. There are some special cytological stainings available, uh, for example, um, immunocytology for um, P9 coronavirus or certain fungal stains or a gram staining if we want to look for bacteria. In view of um, uh, bacterial infections, just want to mention that CSF cultures are actually negative in 80% and we better be aware of that. A reason always to combine MRI with CSF examination is because um, not every CNS inflammation shows changes in the MRI. Uh, but might have changes in the CSF. And that also holds true the other way around, and I'll show you that in a bit. All right, so finally, let's come to the role of MRI in inflammatory CNS disease. And there is a whole list. So first of all, I do want to exclude, especially before my CSF tab, that my animal has um, an increase intracranial pressure or a cerebellar herniation. If I tried to do a CSF tap here in the cisterna magna, I'd probably rather get a biopsy of the cerebellum. Now, just a question in the audience. If you are suspicious of increased intracranial pressure, do you think you could safely tap lumbar? Any ideas? No. Thank you very much for your answer. I would not either, because the problem is you're going to have a very, very quick release of um, CSF as well. And if the intracranial pressure is increased, you might get further herniation. Then a further indication um, for MRI and inflammatory disease is obviously to exclude other etiologies responsible for clinical signs. That was a dog that I saw back at the Animal Health Trust. Um, it was presented for paracute um, cerebellar signs. And we can clearly see in those C2-weighted images this very well wedge-shaped, well-demarcated C2 hyperintensity in the region of the rostral cerebellar art artery, which is quite um, typical for an infarct of that area. So to be honest with you, I wouldn't really tap a dog with the acute onset of a paracute onset of clinical signs um, and a lesion looking like that. MRI might also help us proving certain entry zones, as shown here in that MRI of a cat with an ascending otitis media internia here in the cranial cavity. Or the next case that I want to show you that was a little terrier that I saw when I was still working at the tear clinic car that was spitting by a hunting dog colleague in its head. You can clearly see on that T2 weighted image the bruising and swelling of the temporal muscle. But also you can appreciate that you have a skull fracture 
structure here, which is more clearly seen obviously here on the CT. We have an impression fracture, but the actual damage on the brain can be nicely seen on MRI. And obviously, if you don't do anything about this, that will probably also end um, in a proper abscess formation. So what I did on the dog, it was actually quite scary. Um, I saw the dog, um, it was actually the day before Halloween, and I just felt like that was truly Halloween, because I did not only cultivate passerella canis here from that injection bite side, I also pulled out a lot of hair. But with the um, specific treatment, the dog eventually um, did fine. All right, um, I don't know if there are any questions so far, but now I come to a big chunk of the talk about the role of MRI in characterizing inflammation in dogs and cats. And I first really want to start off with the MUOs and how they can be characterized um, by MRI. If we leave it quite easy, characterizing MUO signalment would be any dog over six months old, um, MRI revealing multiple single or diffuse intraaxial hyperintensity um, in T2 weighted images, the CSF being inflammatory with a mononuclear pleocytosis, and infectious disease testing being negative. And what you want to test for actually really depends on your um, geography. However, if we look more in detail, looking at GME, NME, and NLE, we already have a classical signal. The classical dog with a GME is going to be a terrier or toy breed. More females than males are um, affected. It's going to be young to middle-aged. Um, and the neurological presentation, unless we got a focal GME, will be multifocal. With enemy, the classical breed would be the Pug, the Maltese, the Chihuahua, but many dog breeds have been so far described with enemy. Maybe females, if you look through the literature, a bit overrepresented compared to males, and this is also my personal experience. And these dogs are usually young when they present, one or two years old, right? They usually show full brain signs. Whereas the dogs with an NLE, a typical one would be the Yorkshire Terrier or the French Bulldog. They have a quite more variable age, presenting from 1 to 10 years of age. And they will show neurological signs compatible mainly with forebrain and brainstem signs. So if I look at the MRI hallmarks, respectively, with a GME, I'm going to have focal or multifocal, mainly white matter disease. Meninges are infected. The lesions are mostly contrast enhancing with mass effect. I'll show you pictures in a second. In parks, the forebrain will be affected. Um, gray and white matter, you lose distinction of gray and white matter. The meninges are affected. And mostly, the contrast enhancing lesions with mass effect. Whereas with the necrotizing look encephalitis, um, especially if the deep white matter is affected and you have cavitations. You may see poor contrast enhancing, not really mass lesions. And what I, what I want to point out, is especially if you have very deep white matter lesions, your CSF can actually um, be normal in these cases. So just here a quick overview of the classic GME case for me would be the middle-aged female Westy, multifocal. Um, uh, signs and multifocal MRI changes if it's a um, diffuse GME. Here, mainly white matter affected, meninges affected, and mass affected. Whereas the typical enemy patient would be the young pug with forebrain localization. So he's going to be seizuring. He's going to be compulsively circling. He might be centrally blind. And you have that typical loss of distinction between white and gray matter as seen here. Um, and you got contrast enhancement, and the meninges are affected um, as well. Whereas the typical NLE patient here, for example, shown um, a Yorkie, you have multifocal lesions, not only affecting corona radiati, but, uh, radiata, but also the deep white matter as the centrum semi-ovale here in that region. And in T1-weighted images, you really can appreciate that these might be cavitations with T1 hypo-intense lesions. Very often, you 
do have contrast enhancement. I actually took this very nice pictures from um, the publication of Thomas Flegel that whoever did not read or see that yet, I would strongly um, recommend. And in my next slide, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but I just wanted to point out that he um, describes breed-specific MRI characteristics of necrotizing encephalitis in the Yorkie French Bulldog Park and Chihuahua, and it is a great study to, to look at. But in general, we can say that any dog can be affected by um, any type of M MUO. So we got to stay open-minded. There are even case reports of individual patients who have different forms of MUO in their brain. But very often, small female young adult dogs are affected. There's one study um, uh, of my colleague Ine Cornelis who showed that about a quarter of cases are lead, a large breed dog, so don't exclude a MEO just because it's a large breed dog. And quite interestingly, that study showed that large breed dogs um, present significantly more with decreased mentation as the small breed dogs um, actually do. Um, especially looking at the necrotizing forms, it is unclear if the different breed-specific encephalitis represent a variation of the same etiology or different pathologic entities. For sure, we do um, know that there are some genetic um, risk factors. We do know, for example, on chromosome 12, there is the Duke, uh, dog leukocyte um, antigen class 2 complex um, that is affected, but also um, uh, chromosome 15 and 4 seem to play a certain uh, role um, to uh, actually have a risk factor in developing these. Now, in the park dog, there is a commercial um, test available um, to check for the risk of developing an NME. However, if the dog is tested homozygotously uh, um, um, positive, that does not mean he's having the disease. So just be very, very careful with interpreting um, those diseases. And also genetic risk factors for NME in Maltese dogs and Chihuahua have been um, presented. Oh, thank you very much for um, uh, the um, article. I've also mentioned it all in the notes um, where you can get those articles. All right. The MO for sure is immune mediated. There might be genetic predisposition or there might be some infectious or environmental um, triggers. A lot of studies have investigated which infectious triggers there could be or whether infectious disease are underlying. The uh, possible role of Bartonella or Mycoplasma has been discussed and there has been a single case report uh, of a case with um, MUO where um, this temper has been isolated um, uh, from the brain. However, I do clearly think that the response to immunosuppressive therapy rules out an active infection um, as the underlying cause. Now, just a few words about treatment and prognosis of um, MEU. In general, obviously, you want to treat with immunosuppression and immunomodulation. However, until infectious agents are ruled out, we only want to give um, low-dose corticosteroids and cover with antibiotics. Uh, the general prognosis says that about a quarter of the cases die within the first week. However, if they survive the first three months of their disease, they are very likely not to die from the MOU, M, M, MUO. Um, if they show decreased mentation, seizures, and CSF neutrophilia upon presentation, they um, are likely to have a poor outcome. There are also some MRI signs that might be associated with poor outcome, um, such as lo loss of cerebral sulci and foramen magnum herniation, all indicating really an increased intracranial pressure. Also, if um, uh, treatment is discontinued, before resolution of MRI signs, the prognosis is really bad, and I'll come to that in a second, but you should never discontinue treatment in those cases. Um, well, we have to question whether overall the prognosis for the necrotizing forms might be a bit worse than for the GME, and we have to mention to the owners that generally there is not a cure, but rather a control of the disease, so usually lifelong therapy is needed and uh, immune triggers such as 
vaccination um, should be avoided. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all these numbers with you. I just want to show that in the past past, the mules used to be treated just with pregnancy alone, and they used to have median survival times of just weeks to months. Um, however, since we add in other immunomodulatory drugs, and there is a whole list of it, and I've mentioned all the studies um, at the back in the references, median survival times could be prolonged from anything from one and a half to five years. Yeah? There are a few things that definitely need further investigation, um, but are promising, such as autologous bone marrow-derived um, mesenchymal stem cells or radiation therapy, which seems to work for both um, focal and disseminated lesions. <clears throat> Just to very quickly add in my personal experience, the case that I had my personal longest follow-up was the combination of cytarabin, cyclosporin, and prednisolone. Prednisolone at the lowest dose every other day, and that dog survived over 12 years and eventually died from um, heart failure. And that is really a combination. Um, that is always a combination that um, I really I really like. And the reason why I try um, to lower prednisolone alone as far as I can, because that is the drug that um, owners will mostly complain um, about um, uh, with clinical um, uh, uh, side effects. I just seen that a question um, came in if you should also avoid rabies vaccine. Is there legal support not to vaccinate his patient? Well, let's put it this way. As long as, from the medical point of view, as long as a dog is under immunomodulatory uh, uh, treatment, you should not vaccinate, right? Um, the vaccination is probably not going to work. He's not going to be able um, to build up a good uh, humoral or cellular immunity, I would expect. That's the one thing. If you're lucky and you can get off this dog for any kind of medication, like with any immune-mediated disease, I would still tell the client, be careful to vaccinate for at least six months after the dog is medication and relapse free because it might just trigger the next relapse. And you might just really have um, to change the lifestyle in terms of not going to dog shows, avoiding crowded places or exposition to not vaccinated animals, no traveling, um, not putting the dog into kennels where um, it's required. And obviously, we do vaccinate for a good reason. All I'm saying be really careful in vaccinating these guys because they might not even build up immunity or get a relapse. Okay, I just want to share one case with you that went all, almost down um, the wrong line. It was a little Westie that I saw back when I was still um, working in the UK. Um, he was five years old and the history was that he lived on a farm. He was progressively wobbly, not just since four weeks, upon questioning the owner, it might have been even two or three months. Peripheral blood and clinic exam was normal. I examined him, I localized multifocally to the CNS, but especially to the cerebellum. So I got, thought, oh my god, we hardly ever see any infectious disease in the UK anyway, he's probably going to have a GME. So we went to MRI um, with that dog, and actually what we saw on MRI is that atrophied cerebellum largely surrounded by that C2 hyperintensity and was also a flare hyperintensity. Um, was T1 hypo intense, and we had some um, contrast enhancement around the cerebellar and brainstem meninges. So that didn't really look like a GME to me. We tapped the dog, the CSF was inflammatory, and actually the um, uh, CSF PCR was positive for neosporocaninum. So whenever you see a case like that, just bear neosporocaninum in the back of your head. Um, neosporosis seems to have a predilection really for the cerebellum in adult dogs for one reason or the other. We also multicentrically then collected seven of these cases and um, uh, published them. Um, talking about characterization of inflammation, I just 
quickly want to point out what you see here is um, a dog with a pre-contrast T1 um, intraaxial hyper um, intensity in the brain that is showing a partial signal void on T2 star gradient echo. So it's quite clear that's going to be a hemorrhagic lesion, right? And if we talk about inflammatory disease, the one, if you see a hemorrhage that you have to think about is lung worms, right? So angiostrongylus is going to be um, associated with um, CNS um, hemorrhages, brain and spinal cord um, as well. So what I would like to ask clinically um, uh, to the uh, owners, does this dog like to eat grass? And why do I ask that? If they eat grass, they're likely to also eat some um, uh, slugs or snails, which are the intermediate hosts of the lungworm, and um, they therefore ingest the larva stage 3, which then um, does it cycle through the dog and infects it with lung worms. Uh, why they actually start to bleed, we don't know exactly. It seems to interfere with the clotting cascade, but these dogs might as well go into um, DIC. All right, a lot talking about dogs. Just a few words about some cat disease. Um, uh, the question is, is it what we call the French heartworm, Angiostrongylus fathorum? Yes, this is what we call um, the um, French heartworm. And another question uh, was, what antibiotics do you recommend in the period in which you're waiting for clarification of infectious agents? Um, I would definitely take an antibiotic that penetrates into the CNS um, here in Germany or in the UK. The standard I test for PCR-wise are Toxoplasma Neospora and Distemper. For Distemper, I can't do anything. So to cover for Toxoplasma or Neospora, I would um, choose trimetoprim fulfonamide or clindamycin. Uh, if for any reason the dog has a travel history and uh, I'm a bit suspicious or have any other evidence blood-wise that the dog, for example, could have Ehrlichia, I would cover with doxycycline. I hope that answers your question. Okay, getting back to our kitties. Um, just a few words about CNS FIP. The classic clinical patient um, will be the young adult cat. However, be aware we also have an FIP peak in the elder cats. They are classically from multi-cat households. Neurologic signs might be variable, but they very often have concurrent generalized um, disease. Um, uh, they have weight loss, anorexia, fever, we might find the body cavity infusions, hyperglobulinemia, ocular pathologies are possible, so always examine the eye as well. Just what I really want to point out, what is classically seen in MRI, it is a surface-related disease. Um, it is a surface-related disease, right? So what you will see, meningitis or uh, really inflammation of the ependyme or periventriculitis. You can have choroid plexitis and therefore disturbance of CSF flow or reabsorption and secondary hydrocephalus as in this um, case here. If we take a CSF tab, that's going to be macroscopically cloudy and wow, our Pandy test is going to be really, really positive here. We have a lot of inflammatory cells usually uh, a marked neutrophilic um, to pyogranulomatose inflammation. And ideally, we can test positive for the feline or the feline mutated coronavirus in the CSF or run a uh, immunocyto um, cytology um, that is positive on, on the CSF. Um, now, um, how about treatment and prognosis in those infectious disease? In general, obviously, um, for viral disease, we can't really do very much. Bacterial disease, um, we need to choose the right antibiotic. We need to give it um, IV for the first days. We need to treat long enough. And the first few days, actually, um, an anti-inflammatory dose of glucocorticoids is indicated as well. If we have abscess formation, um, surgical treatment is usually always indicated. For fungal disease, obviously, you use antifungal um, medication. For protozoal disease, um, 
uh, clindamycin or trimetoprim sulfonamate, probably in combination with perimethamine. And actually, in the case of the little Westy that I've shown you before with the cerebellitis, uh, we gave it for eight weeks and we bo gave both clindamycin and trimetoprim sulfonamide. Um, uh, for uh, rickettsial disease, the doxycycline, oh sorry, this has moved a bit, um, for verminous disease, obviously, um, uh, depending on the parasite, in case of Angiostrongylus, um, I would um, uh, treat uh, the um, with fenbendazole. All right, just another cat with some very striking um, MRI features. That little female spay cat, three years old, was presented to the clinic where I work now with um, acute onset of clusters of orofacial and generalized epileptic seizures. And what, what you can probably appreciate in that sequential um, uh, MRI to two weighted is that bilateral symmetric structure that is hyper intense. Anybody in the audience want to comment on what structure that is? Yes. Well, the structure is the hippocampus. I absolutely agree. And uh, the one weighted image without contrast was unremarkable, but we had that inflammation. Um, uh, so, sorry, we had the contrast enhancement in the hippocampus as well. Um, but I have to question at this stage, can we talk about hippocampal necrosis or sclerosis? Could it be just post ictal changes? Uh, I personally, if I have such a contrast enhancement, do tend to think there is something rather active going on. We also tapped that cat and it showed moderate mononuclear inflammation and the um, CSF PCRs for coronavirus and toxoplasma were negative. So what is wrong? What is wrong with this cat? Um, does that cat actually display mesial or medial temporal lobe epilepsy? Is there an inflammatory cause? Could it be even limbic encephalitis? Um, uh, that is very well described in humans. Um, going back just to a couple of pathology studies looking at hypocampal sclerosis or sclerosis and necrosis, one study found that a third of epileptic cats do display hippocampal sclerosis, and this is mostly affected with disease um, of inflammatory nature, such as um, limbic encephalitis. And that other study showed as well that three quarters um, uh, of cases with hippocampal sclerosis or necrosis reveal inflammatory infiltrates, a third of which, again, um, would be um, consistent with limbic encephalitis. And there's actually a test that you can, um, that can be performed in the serum. You can test um, serum antibodies against voltage-gated um, potassium channel complex which are positive in a third of cases with um, limbic encephalitis in cats, as it is reported um, in humans. Something else that I want to mention that cats um, might show, apart from generalized and orofacial seizures, if you find hippocampal changes on MRI like that, do you know um, which uh, functional um, region of the brain the hippocampus um, belongs to? Anybody know? Yes, I can see some people are typing. Well, yes, it definitely belongs to the forebrain, but functionally talking, it's part of the limbic system. And limbic system is involved in emotions, so very often you see behavioral problems in those animals, right? Uh, especially in people, we know it is um, also associated with function of memory, right? But memory loss is not so easy to test in our animals. However, in this cat, we decided to load it on anti-epileptic drugs and to start it on prednisolone to mix per kick because um, I, I was afraid it would have limbic encephalitis. All right. 
Let's head on. In some cases, MRI and CSF might not give us the definite diagnosis, and we might actually need um, brain biopsy. And that's where I need MRI as well for biopsy planning. Biopsy, we can either take an open brain, brain biopsy via craniectomy or craniotomy, or the more elegant form via keel, keyhole or needle biopsy. This can either be performed freehand and um, I've never done it freehand, but the publications uh, from my colleague Thomas Flegel from Leipzig, and he actually had an accuracy um, for the type of inflammation in 82% of freehand biopsy, which I find quite amazing. Then you have the possibility of stereotactic brain biopsy. A lot of people use the stereotactic frame. The accuracy there is about 95%. Um, and uh, you have mean needle placement errors. Uh, that are that little that uh, stereotactic brain biopsy can be recommended for use in dogs with the lesions any bigger than 3.3 millimeters. And last but not least, neural navigation, which I'll go into in a bit. Just to show you some pictures here, here is a dog that I did the um, craniectomy on for a superficial meningeal biopsy, but really that way we just do it if we think um, lesion is primarily meningeal or um, uh, superficial. Here, just fro shown from this uh, study from the colleague um, Ross Meisel, um, a stereotactic frame based biopsy device that can either be CT or um, MR compatible. And a very recent um, uh, literature um, actually. Uh, described uh, MRI and CT compatible stereotactic brain biopsy uh, in dogs using these patient-specific face masks, which I personally have never, never seen it live, but I do find the idea very elegant. All right, last but not least, just a few words about neural navigation, which is a frameless stereotactic imaging um, based system which uh, we performed or is performed at the clinic where I used to work um, previously. Just to explain briefly, as you can see, there's a marker placed on a patient. The patient is in MRI. Um, then the system localizes the lesion um, in three dimension, uh, three dimensionally in reference to those markers. Then the acquired set of data is used and with the help of some position sensors, the position of the biopsy needle that you can um, see here in reference to the needle is displayed on those images. All right. Another role of MRI in inflammatory disease, and I'll come soon to an end of my talk, got three minutes left, is the monitoring um, of disease progression or regression and the treatment response. response. The first um, question that we have to ask, when do we do it? And I do think it really depends on the underlying cause. I would say definitely before treatment discontinuation um, in disease such as infectious disease, because I do hope to control them at some stage that I can continue uh, with medication or before any significant treatment modification. If you look at the studies that I've also mentioned before, MRIs are usually repeated after three months initially, and then after 12 months again, which I think would be a nice idea. However, I personally always make it dependent on clinical treatment response, and obviously we also have to make it dependent on the financial situation um, of our clients. However, you should always repeat MRI in combination with CSF, and I'll show you why just um, with two cases. The first case I want to show you is a, uh, a Westie with suspected MEO. Um, he presented for proprioceptive deficits and centrally visual deficits. And what we see before treatment are these um, multifocal diffuse intraaxial T2 hyperintensities in the brain that also contrast enhance. Uh, the dog clinically responded very well to prednisolone and cytorabin. He could see perfectly again the proposite deficits, however, were still there. And in the repeat MRI, we can still see the T2 weighted lesions and still some contrast enhancement, right? So looking at the MRI, I must consider that inflammatory disease is still very active. Now I want to show you the CSF tab of that dog. You can see some um, monocytic cells and monocytic um, or, or uh, uh, monocytic um, 
clusters here of cells before treatment. And after two months of treatment, I must apologize for the quality of um, that CSF tab. They're obviously autolytic cells, but I could hardly find any inflammatory cells in the CSF tab. So if I had just done the CSF tab in the dog, I would have thought I control it quite well. If you go back to that MRI, I'm not happy, right? So always combination of both. And just the second case, last case I want to share with you, a three and a half year old um, Chihuahua that presented for multifocal neurologic signs. Here you can see the MRI lesion before treatment um, here. Um, T2 hyper intense, diffusely multifocal in, in the forebrain here, region of the corona radiata, but also here in the mesencephalon with contrast enhancement, as you can see on these T2 one weighted post contrast images. That owner agreed um, to repeat MRI. One year later, the dog was under treatment with prednisolone, side arabin, and cyclosporin was clinically actually normal on the neuro exam. I was fairly happy with the repeat MRI here in the mesencephalon. There's still a small lesion visible. Couldn't really say that could also be just a scar, right? But we cannot see any contrast enhancement anymore. So just after the MRI, I told the client, well, it's look good. We'll do the CSF tab. And I was truly shocked. I must apologize, I don't have a picture of the CSF before treatment, but we had a moderate mononuclear inflammation. And just look at that inflammatory um, CSF that we had um, after one year of treatment. If I had considered that MRI, I wouldn't have expected that CSF. And that's why you should always do the combination. All right. Last not but least, um, just to mention, um, there might be a future role of MR, uh, MR spectroscopy um, in monitoring um, and also diagnosing inflammatory disease. There have been a few studies out there that describe um, the um, uh, MR um, that provides metabolic information about lesions that might help to distinguish inflammatory from neoplastic lesions or these metabolic changes might also um, help us monitoring um, the progress of a disease or um, treatment um, response. All right, so in the end, and I hope you're um, all still with me, I have my first um, uh, sorry, my third question from you. Which of the following are classified as the MO, MUO in dogs? Is it the NME? Oh, OK. I see uh, everybody responded already. Is it just the NME and the NLE? Is it just GME? Is it all three or all suspected inflammatory disease um, where no MRI is performed? People are still voting, so we'll wait. While people are still voting, I just see that another question from Elizabeth Pathmore came up um, regarding increased intracurrent pressure, pressure. What is your preference, hypertonic, saline, or mannitol? Do you reach for one um, or the other, depending on whether changes are in, inside or outside the internal capsule? Uh, no, I think you can obviously use either of them. In all cases, you just got to really make sure um, your animal is very well hydrated before you give the drug. And also, I like to check on my electrolytes that are in balance. All right. So correct answer, obviously, it is NME, NLE, and GME that are considered as the MUOs. All right, next question. Which inflammatory CNS disease seems to have predilection to the cerebellum in dogs? Is it the NME, the NLE, the GME, or the Neospora caninum infection? Everybody voted. I don't think everything, anything's changing anymore. Well, thank you for listening so well. Truly, it is Neospora. You're all very good. I should have um, picked harder questions. Here's the last question. 
Um, which neurological signs um, is a cat most likely to reveal with bilateral symmetric hippocampal pathology seen on MRI? Is it generalized and focal seizures, focal or facial seizures and behavioral changes? Is it generalized and focal seizures, focal seizures affecting one limb and behavioral changes? Is it generalized seizure activities circling to one side and behavioral changes? or generalized and focal, meaning oral facial seizures, activity and ataxia. All right, the right answer was A, generalized oral facial, um, uh, generalized and oral facial seizures um, and behavioral changes. Very, uh, really a very, very um, smart, um, clever audience. All right, now I come to the end of my talk. I really just want to acknowledge some previous colleagues of mine, Luisa De Vizio from the Animal Health Trust and Konrad Jurina from the Tierklinika because um, I took some cases for the presentation see here that I've seen whilst I was working in those um, institutions. And at this stage, I want to thank you for your attention. Here's some further reading you might want to go into. And I'm very happy to answer any further questions. And in case you've enjoyed this a bit, please feel free to join me at VetMeet. VetMeet are currently running MR and CT webinars sponsored by Hallmark, and I will be launching a neurology module with focus on interdisciplinary approaches starting early next year. And again, thank you also um, for all the questions you asked in big. Thank you so much for your presentation there uh, today. I'm just going to hand the microphone duties over now to Dr. Karen Johnson just to say a couple of final words before we sign off. It was a fantastic talk. I loved all the cases um, throughout it, and I think the so notes that everybody is saying, they really enjoyed it as well. So I know it takes a lot of time to put a talk together, um, Laura, but thank you so much. We all really appreciate it. So everybody, um, I think we're all signing off. Um, have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you ha uh, happen to be in the world. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next time. And a big thank you to Vet Education, Charisma, Philip, you do a wonderful job with these webinars, and I know you're up at about 5 in the morning in Australia, so thank you much, so much for everything you do. Okay, everybody, have a good day. Cheerio.